Okay, testing, 6 to 1, 6 to 1, testing, yes, seems... The testing was on purpose, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very happy to warmly welcome you all to Terrain and Networking Conference 2011 here in Prague. My name is Janne Kanner, and as the president of Terrain, I hope you really enjoy these four days at the conference. This year marks 25 years of our pan-European collaboration and efforts to network the networkers under Terrain. This time we will celebrate the anniversary by looking ahead into the future networks and advanced applications, supporting new collaboration and the digital work and lifestyle. If you look back at the conference programs five or ten years back, it's, it's easy to forget how far we have come in those few years. But also it's easy to forget that many of the challenges, not all, but some, are still the, ch are still the same. So I think we should really focus on where we want to be in the next five or 10 or even 25 years from now on. So the theme of the conference this time is enabling communities. European research and education networks are used daily by roughly 40 million end users, a huge community. Over 4,000 people have been directly involved in the collaborative terrain activities just during the past couple of years. Also a big community. Finally, there are more than 500 of us here at the conference site and many more watching live and joining us through various social media. We all represent many different communities, from universities to research and cultural institutions, schools, libraries, research hospitals, also different scientific, artistic or technical disciplines, virtual organizations, project teams and study groups. I hope that by the end of the week, this conference has touched upon something to support and en enable each of our communities. But before that, first and foremost, I would like to thank our host, the National Research and Education Network of the Czech Republic, CESNET, for this wonderful opportunity to get together in the historical city of Prague. I also give huge thanks to all of our generous sponsors and partners for sharing our theme and making this event possible. Once more, welcome to all and hope you really enjoy your time here. Next, our gracious host Cessnet will welcome you all through the words of Dr. Jan Krunterad. He is the CEO and member of the board of directors of Cessnet. Many of you know him as an active member of the research networking community, having served six years as Dante board member and being currently a member of the GN3 project executive committee, for example. So Dr. Kuntarat, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, come and enjoy the unique atmosphere of our Asian capital cities, taste the delicacy of chess cushion, and refresh yourself with a glass of world-famous beer in a typical Prague pub. I am sure we will have a good time working in Prague. Those were the words I used at the 26th annual meeting of the Terena Networking Conference last year in Vilnius, to invite you to Prague. I dare not to guess which impress you most, but I am thrilled to see that so many of you have arrived. I have pride to announce that more than 500 guests have, invited, have accepted our invitation. 
A great thanks go to the Terena Association for resolving to entrust the organization of this year's conference to the Cessnet Association of Universities and Academy in Science of the Czech Republic, which I represent here. We appreciate it immensely. We perceive the entrustment as a recognition of our work so far in the field of international networking, research and development, and also as a little gift from the European expert community to our 15th birthday. The world is very different now than it was 15 years ago when Cessnet Association was established. These days, all our effort was targeting to increase network bandwidth, speed and availability. We have had to employ various measures, e.g. web content caching, in order to save especially capacity of international line. We are facing very different and much more complex issue today. Researchers today ask for not only computer network services, but they then demand very advanced and sophisticated A-infrastructure services that includes high capacity and low latency network services, computer services using grid cloud supercomputing, storage, AAI, security, and services enabling cooperation in global environment. In the Czech Republic, we have already started transformation of NR and CESnet to e-infrastructure provider. Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports of the Czech Republic has approved funding of a new project entitled CESnet Large Infrastructure. The project is scheduled for five years, 2011 to 2015. As the name suggests, the objective is to re reconstruct Cessnet 2 National Research Network to so-called large infrastructure, a broad range of equipment, devices, resources, as well as facilities for research to provide conditions for efficient collaboration of large scientific teams, including both people and experimental devices, the component of which may even be situated in different countries. As with all previous activities of CESnet, the project CESnet LAC infrastructure will be implemented in cooperation with European schemes of support for science and research, especially project GNC, EGI and PRACE. CESnet large infrastructure is one of high priority projects described in the roadmap for large research, development and innovation infrastructure in the Czech Republic. The document was created in response to the European S3 roadmap, discussed and the inclusion of Czech large infrastructure in the European research area and was approved and directing to implementation by government of the Czech Republic in March 2010. One of the complementary projects to Cessnet large infrastructure is the project extension of national research and development information and infrastructure in the regions, AGA. The project was awarded by Ministry of Education use of sport to Cessnet very recently, actually on April 29th. In the period of two and a half years, Cessnet will use EU structure fund for the transformation of NRNs to new informational infrastructure in the country's regions. But let us return to the European and even global networking scene. As I have already mentioned, we are facing many interesting issues, but I would better call them challenges. Future networks, communications and identities, digital lifestyle, supporting collaboration and advanced applications. Those are the main topics of very packed agenda that lies on front of us for the next four days. I am sincerely looking forward to hearing all of the suggestions and ideas that you and our esteemed guests have brought to Prague. 
Have a very enjoyable and also productive stay in Prague. Welcome. Before the conference properly opens with our first keynote speaker, I would like to talk to you a bit about the contest we are running. To celebrate 25 years of Terrena supporting the research and education networking community, we invite all of you to tell us your most creative, funny, innovative and unique answers to the question, how will the internet change people's lives? in the next 25 years. You can do that and participate in the contest by submitting a one minute video of your answer to that question. And there will be an iPad rewarded to the winning entry. You can also vote for the submissions and videos you like the best. They can be found through the conference web pages on, on YouTube. The contest is open for everyone, and it's open until midday on Wednesday. So you have two days. You can find all the details on the Terrain web pages. You can use any camera you like. There is a small recording studio set up in the Terrain booth that you can take advantage of. But even better, we give out a very small video camera for all of you as a conference gift. You can collect it at the Terrena booth if you haven't done so already during the breaks with a voucher found inside your conference badge. The camera is very simple. It has an on-off button and then a big button in front. You push that until some lights appear first green and then a blinking red light. And then when you push it again, it starts recording. And when you want to stop, preferably one minute after that, you push it again. And it's all recorded in a small memory card that's inside the device. And it's very easy to enter the contest. I mean, I know that you won't have a lot of time to create spectacular special effects during these two days, I'm sure. But the ideas count, and the attitude counts, and if it makes us laugh, that better. Uh, I can show you, and now I'm improvising. Uh, this will be very easy to top. So I will just push it here, and look at the camera, and start my one minute show. In 25 years, the world will be full of small micro-scale devices. They will be everywhere. They will be all over the roads you drive on to monitor the traffic, to monitor the weather, and send data to the internet, to the applications that control traffic lights and control speed limits. They will also be all over carried by the winds to monitor the status of the nature, the environment, to make sure we don't mess it up, or if we want to correct something, we do it right. They will also monitor whether there will be earthquakes or volcanoes erupting. And when you eat your breakfast yogurt, there will be some devices in it. They will enter your body, and they will monitor your health, and send some data to some applications on the internet. And if they get stuck to your teeth when you eat, you may even hear the radio. OK, I think I have to stop now, because I think I'm being watched. Okay, looking forward to the next 25 years. Thank you.
The first keynote talk of the conference will take us on a ride to the nanoscale world. Professor Jaroslav Gocha is the Scientific Director for Life Sciences at the Central European Institute of Technology and Director of the National Center for Biomolecular Research at Masaryk University. He will give us a perspective on the hard science of using molecular eyes in battling viruses and bacteria with the aid of computational chemistry, grid computing, and of course, research networking. Professor, please. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I have to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to, to present my talk here. And of course, I'd like to thank Mr. Chairman for, for the introduction. It's interesting to see what's going to happen in the next 25 years. Uh, we'll see how right are we and how misleading are we. Uh, the community here is a little uh, different than I used to talk to because I'm actually working in a little bit different field that certainly overlaps with computer networking. Anyway, to get an inspiration what to talk about, I went through maybe 10 years and I was tracing all the plenary talks that were introducing Tirina conferences, and I found interesting subjects like, uh, like uh, uh, surgery, neurosciences, physics, earth problems, and of course computer networking. But I didn't find uh, things that would belong to micro or nano world. And I thought that's a nice opportunity for me because that's my field, so I could talk about and I could try to, to overlap things belonging to that world with computer networking. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, my talk is going to be uh, composed of, of four parts, even if you see five things here. But before I start to talk about anything, I should define. I should define micro world or nano world. It's a question of, of distances. It's a question of, of, of uh, generally valid distances in the world. We are talking about world because our distance, our common distance is a meter. We are two meter tall, our cars are four to five meter long, the majority of them. Uh, our houses are six meter tall or whatever. We measure in, we used to measure in, in meters. Meter is quite common distance for us. And also, in this normal world, we meet objects that are of this size. We meet people, cars, trains. We can see trees, hills. Everything is on the meter scale. If we move in the, in the field of uh, or in the nano or micro world, we are going to meet objects like viruses, bacteria, cells, single molecules, a completely different world. Uh, back to the composition of my talk, as I said, it's going to be composed of four parts. Uh, in the, the, the first part, that's going to be invitation to the world. I will show a few movies that bring us to the world of nano or micro size. I'm talking about nano and micro. We, usually we talk about micro, micro world. In reality, it is really somewhere in between. It's, it's some, sometimes it's, it's a nano distance, sometimes it's micro. The majority of objects would be in between. I will show you. Uh, okay, and then the rest, or the remaining three modules will be always the same. I will define a problem that is a human problem. And then the problem to be solved or to be able to solve the problem, we have to go to the micro world. So I will bring you there. We'll define the problem there. We will try to, to, to solve the problem there. And then we'll go back 
to the normal world to apply the result. In all cases, it will be related to computer networking. And in all cases, it will be related to drug design. So this talk will or can easily be called also computer networking and drug design. I'll have to switch the presentation for a while and uh, run the first movie, which is something quite typical. So what, what, what is that? Uh, this is you, or maybe me, and these guys are viruses. They are much smaller, of course, but uh, that's a typical situation. You, you get in touch with a virus. Virus is a very stupid particle on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a very clever particle. The stupidity of virus follows from the fact that it only contains proteins and the nucleic acids, and it cannot reproduce itself. So it would live only one particle in a time. The clever thing about virus is that it is able to find cells, like human cells, and to use the cells to reproduce itself. That's very clever, on the other hand. So it works uh, in, in, in such a way, you, you get in touch, or I get in touch with the virus, virus will touch a human cell, it injects DNA to the human cell or RNA to, to the human cell. Based on this information, the human cell will generate, will generate new DNA and also new proteins. So it generates new particles of the new virus. New particles will, put to get, will be put together and the new multiplicated virus will leave the cell. That's how it works. Now let's try to see the, th the whole thing in more details. In uh, more details, it looks like that. That's the, that's the cell. And this is the virus. The virus can go inside, or even it doesn't have to go inside. It has to, inside, it has to put inside the genetic information. That's very necessary. And let's now imagine the situation that we want to develop a drug that would act against the virus. In reality, we have only two stages to, uh, to, 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 to attract. The first stage is the stage when the virus comes close to the cell and recognizes the cell. Oh, no, 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 that was not what I wanted to do. I have to play it again. This is the second stage, by the way. Uh, the first stage is the stage when the virus recognizes the cell. That's the stage. Uh, if we would be able to block this stage, the virus would never recognize the cell. It would never find it. It would leave the body without any acting. If, uh, by the way, if you take the very known, uh, very known virus of avian flu, it's exactly the case. It comes to us, it doesn't see us. It leaves us. It can mutate very easily to recognize us, but these days it doesn't recognize us. So, so, so what this interaction is, that's in fact, uh, or what, what these blue guys are, that's our molecules that play a role of eyes. Our eyes recognizes other people. Virus has no eye. The virus eye is this molecule, and that's the reason why molecule eyes is in the title of the talk. These objects have no eyes, these objects have molecule eyes. One molecule, one eye. So that would be the first, first strategy to, 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 to generate a drug against a virus, to block this recognition, to block the eye. The second strategy to uh, block the virus would be to reach the stage when the, the virus is multiplied, leaves the cell. And of course, because it's, it's the same as it was before. It's, it's a copy. It's a copy. It again recognizes the original cell. 
So it must cut itself by the cell surface because if it would not do, they would never, they would be multiplied, but they would stay on the cell surface, they would be very easily recognized by the immune system and killed. So that's the second strategy how to develop drug against the flu, for example. To cut or to block this phase. And actually we have, uh, I think, two, three preparates these days that are sold to, uh, to, to, to be used against the flu, and they are based on, on, on blocking this phase. This tummy flu, and you may know better than me. So that's the, that's the strategy of... Uh, one particular direction in a drug design, what you can see out of it. If you want to do, if you, if you want to be efficient in drug design, you have to know, you have to have a good view, you have to, you have, to have a good picture of the micro world. This is a model. Let's go to see, let's go and see the reality. This is, this is the reality. I'll show you real virus. This is a real virus. This is a real virus as uh, obtained by, by X-ray diffraction methodology. This is an atomic resolution thing. What you can see, it's a sphere. This particular virus is, is a sphere. The surface is quite complicated. Uh, you see different colors in, in the color representation. Of course, the virus is not yellow or pink or whatever. This virus is composed of 60 identical parts. And if, if I've used this, this uh, color representation, it means that each color represents one part of the, of the virus. This virus is composed of 60 identical parts. By the way, size of this guy Diameter is 17 nanometers. 17 nanometers. We are perfectly in between nano and micro scale. This is a small virus. The majority of virus would be bigger. Uh, let's go to uh, another representation. This is a sort of global representation of the virus. You may not like it. I don't like it. Fortunately, this is only in the computer. Uh, in reality, we have probably many of them here. But that's a different story. This is not, you cannot get any infection from that guy in the computer. I will show you more detailed view of the same thing. Uh, virus is composed of its protein part, which makes the function a nucleic acid part that ensures that it can continue and produce new generations of itself, reproduce. You can see it here. I mean, uh, proteins are not represented in either proteins either or nucleic acid. They are not represented by single atoms because that would be something that would be a mess. So we usually represent proteins. This is the protein part by... Uh, by uh, these tapes and helices. This means beta sheet structure. There is no helix. These are side chains of amino acid. You may remember from your you know, gymnasium uh, biochemistry. This is nucleic acid part. You see the nice helix as you were taught in the school. That's real data. That's real data how it looks from the crystal. And now, in reality, this is the part that would recognize other molecules that are interesting as host molecules. If we take more details, and then I am returning now to, back to the presentation. Uh, this is more detailed, but still schematic view. This is not, these are not viruses, these are bacteria. Bacteria use often the same strategy. Uh, 
these are, as I told, molecule eyes of bacteria. Molecule eyes would recognize molecules on the cell surface, and if the cell is suitable for the bacteria, they will be attached. Again, the same strategy. And now let's go to very detailed manner of viewing things. The whole thing, you don't, you don't follow this green uh, balls, these are ions. What is important? This brown or yellow stuff, that's the protein, that's the molecule I of virus or bacteria, whatever, in the schematic representation. And this is the molecule that belongs to, say, a human cell. That's the, this is the recognition. They, have, they, they create a complex. The surprising thing is that the part on the human cell surface is a carbohydrate, is a sugar. And it happens many times that sugars are used as the molecules that, are, uh, that serve for recognition in, in living systems. So they do not only serve to make a good cake, but they have much, much more important function in living systems. They play a role of recognition. And once the protein from the virus see the sugar on the cell surface, it's a message for the virus that it's a good, it's a good cell to spend some time with it. Uh, so that's the detailed view. And now, now let's translate the problem more close to, 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 to IT people, to computational people. What will be the task now? If we want to block the, the molecule I, we should find something that will be similar to that small molecule and that will block the molecule I of the virus or bacteria. The problem in the, in the, in the language of computational chemistry is called docking. This is the protein, this is the, the, the molecule I, and this is a drug you are trying to find, and that's the complex that should be quite stable. So this uh, sensor that would normally find a human cell, excuse me, is blocked. So computation, in computational chemistry we call the, the, the the problem docking. But it's a, it's a case where we have one molecule and one molecule. In the case we are trying to search uh, for new drugs, we, we are not working with, with one small molecule, but we are trying to get it, to find it in existing databases of molecules, and they include not hundreds of thousands of molecules, but uh, usually millions of molecules. So you have a set of millions of molecules, or hundreds of thousands of molecules. You have a protein, and you are searching for one that exactly fits the sensitive place on the protein surface. That's the definition of the problem. And the problem is now ready to be solved by computer networks because it, it cannot be solved by a single processor. It would take these 25 years for one case, right? Uh, so in this case, that would be easy to predict what's going to happen in the next 25 years. Uh, it is called, the procedure is called, is called uh, virtual screening. It's called virtual screening. We have a protein, we have a database of ligands, and we are trying to find one that fits the best the, the protein. That's the definition of the problem. Now, how did we solve the problem with using computer network? The architecture of the whole system is like that. There is a virtual screening server that controls the whole, the whole thing. There is a structural database where you get the structural data from. 
the data must be no the data must be really 3d you have to have a information about 3d structure you have to have you have to know the coordinates of all atoms so that's in this database and then you are doing this virtual screening procedure. One client, one, one ligand protein system. One client, one protein ligand system. So these are pretty independent, very independent. So that's, that's the work for clients. And then all the good solution you save in a database where you save what was successful. What, how, how, how strong the complex was, what was the orientation of the ligand, and, and things like that. Uh, these are some data, and we are actually doing it, so we have some real data that could be interesting for you. Uh, I should say that uh, the program that was used in this, for this particular project is called Autodoc Wiener, which is a program that is commonly used in the field of docking. Uh, one docking takes on a single processor takes between say one and ten minutes. Uh, a single client job length in this case was 22 hours because that, that's dependent on the queue you are using and things like that. We have used a short queue with limited length of job. This is the number, 22 hours. Uh, it generated 2,500 jobs. When, when monitoring these jobs, uh, the top period, when the, the, the highest number of concurrently running jobs was observed, was 900. And so it leads to a general speed do of docking about a quarter million, about a quarter million per day. So, we, which means that the job would take, uh, for normal search, would take three, four days in this environment. That's the composition of uh, nodes used. Uh, VOCE is, you will probably better know than me, this, this Central European Virtual Organization. That's the composition. This is a special environment used in the, in, the, in the local meta center. And that's the composition for the VOCE uh, between different states in uh, the Central European infrastructure. I should mention that, f for example, there, there was no one check. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I have to say that it's not a question how, it, it, it's not a mirror. That, 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 that this Croatia would be the most willing country to, to offer. It's just dependent, you, you better know than me, it's just dependent on the local rules of using the network. So this is just the statistics at the time that was performed. It doesn't have any consequences with uh, other things. Okay, uh, so that, that was first module that is called virtual screening. It's, this is based on the theory that was uh, believed in biochemistry some 15, maybe 20, 15, 10 years ago. You may know it. Uh, if you want to, to find a drug, it's based on theory of lock and key. Lock and key. If you want to lock something, you have to find a key with the, which is rigid. But last year, it becomes quite known that the, the, the interaction in biomolecule world is, doesn't function like that. It, 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 it very often functions like, uh, like flexible docking, like flexible interaction. So before it looks like that, and after the interaction it's like that. So the lock and key theory is not true anymore. And that's bad news for computational chemistry and for drug design because it's not only necessary to know all these shapes, but it's also necessary to know all the flexible shapes. And in, in, in computational chemistry or in biochemistry, this is called, this is called uh, molecule conformational space. One molecule, the same molecule, can have different shapes. And that's a bad news, because uh, the, the different shapes 
are caused by rotation around single bonds. And of course, you can rotate by 360 degrees. And if you want to search space, and you, you make a step by uh, 10 degrees, there is 36 options for one bond. For n bonds, this is their number. For four bonds, it generates one and a half million cases, which is not that bad. The, the problem is that this number, 36, you can decrease to 12. You have step 30 degrees, which is still fine. The problem is with this number. This number will not be four. It will be 20, 30, 40. And it will generate so huge number that you would, I mean, 24 years, that would be nothing <laughs> to, to search the conformational space systematically. And therefore, there are different procedures how to make the whole thing realistic or how we can solve the, the, the thing in a realistic time. Uh, one of them is just to remember not all the points that are accessible, but only important energy minima. And we have developed, based on this idea, we have developed a procedure that is called Cicada, and that is uh, searching only very low energy area of the complicated space. The algorithm is very simple from the understanding point of view. It, it, it would work in such a way that you would take one person, one tourist, and send the tourist in the mountains, give the tourist a compass and a piece of paper and a pen, and would tell him, okay, guy, you just follow the, the valleys, and you put on the paper the lowest energy, the lowest altitude places. And you just walk in the mountains a few months, and then you'll give us the map where all important points will be. Of course, if you take 10 tourists, they can work independently. If you take 100 tourists, they can work independently, if they share information. So this is typically, this is a task that could be distributed very well, and we did it. We did this conformational search problem distributed, the Cicada problem distributed, and that's the, that's, the, that's the implementation in the computer network. You have a machine that tells the node which direction it should walk. There are single CPU. Each CPU is working on one particular path, and then there is something to, 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 to save the data. Something to save the data could be pretty complicated. That's how it looks for a, a molecule that has only 19 amino acids, but still, this is, it looks complicated, but each cluster represents quite well-defined molecule shape that is realistic. So it generates a few molecule shapes that are realistic, and you can work with them. And then you see the whole, the, the whole thing, not statically as you did when you did rigid docking, you see the whole thing dynamically. Uh, one graph out of this uh, computation, we actually we took 100, ta 100 uh, tasks and 200 tasks for the blue and green and we're interested how long time is it going to take in different grids to get all of them running. For the, for the red, that was 100 tasks that in the, in the environment of Meta Center became running after, say, one hour, which is a good result. For the remaining two environment, we took 200 tasks, and you see they never started, they, they were never started running all of them. Uh, this is, after a certain number of tasks running, and after a certain time, which is two hours or whatever, the number of running tasks remained the same, and it never went up. 
in this case of blue, which is uh, VOC again, and in the case of you, Asia, it was after quite a long time, and uh, the number of running jobs was 140. Could be interesting for you, maybe more than for me. Uh, okay, let's go to the last module. Still have a little time. It's going to be a little different story. It's, gonna, it's not, not, it's not going to be a flu problem or bacteria problem anymore. By the way, uh, people are afraid of, of uh, this kind of disease like cancer, heart attack or whatever. That's true. That's, that's serious, serious, serious. Uh, serious, serious diseases. But if you would count people that die from bacteria, you would see this, or virus, that these are huge numbers. Huge numbers. People usually don't take this into account. Anyway, uh, the last case, the last story I, I'd like to talk about is about this enzyme. This enzyme is called acetylcholinesterase. You may know it, you may not know it. It's very well known uh, in relation with nerve weapons, with these guys, Tabun, Serin, and Soman. These are very efficient nerve weapons. These days, it's not, they are not that often talked in relation with the war, but that these are much more often taught in relation with terrorism. How they work? They create a complex with the enzyme acetylcholine esterase, and it courses in a few minutes or sometimes seconds that you are killed. Immediately you stay without any movement once you are... Because, because this enzyme is uh, working on, on transferring uh, neural... Uh, neural uh, how do they call it? Uh, a procedure that goes through nerves. And it, one, it's blocked. One, it, it is blocked you stay frozen immediately. So there is a, a strong interest to be able, and this, that's the reaction, that's the, that's the nerve uh, molecule, that's the enzyme, and it creates a stable complex with the molecule, and it kills the enzyme. And the idea is to, to find something that would deblock the enzyme and put it in the original state. There are some molecules, molecules like that and they are not, not very, very efficient. So the idea is to find something better. And uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about details of acetylcholine esterase, just uh, to be able to model seriously the, the protein, you need to know sometimes quite detailed things. Sometimes you need uh, values that are called pKa, because this value, pKa of single amino acids, I, would, I will show later, and these guys would decide, for example, whether this state of the protein or that state is realistic. This is, this is a loop, the green stuff is a loop. In this case it's closed, in this case it's open, and this part would be accessible. Maybe it's not that nicely seen. Anyway, this is pKa related. pKa, that's, that's a value that exists for each amino acid in the protein. It's extremely difficult to measure it, and it's extremely diffi difficult to calculate it on the one hand. On the other hand, it's extremely important for the protein behavior. So it's accessible also by computational methods without going into details. In fact, the pKa will tell you that the, the smaller pKa is, the stronger the acid is. If it's very small, the acid will be strong. If it's big, the acid will be weak. And uh, this is possible to calculate using uh, a methodology that is, called, that is called thermodynamic integration. Uh, and this methodology is based on the most used simulation technique in the field of computational biochemistry, which is called molecular dynamics. 
again, it's based on the second uh, uh, Newton law of motion, probably everybody knows in this auditorium, without going into details. That's a technique that follows a molecule in time. And uh, you follow a molecule in time, and it's the same like you were taking snapshots on a regular basis. And you will get a sequence of pictures, and that's exactly the result of molecular dynamics. The, the key point is that it will allow you to sample the living space for the molecule. So you know all statistically important states where the molecule is. And uh, I skip it, I skip it, and the product, go, go, the product, if I would visualize it, can look like that. This is a protein, that's the tapes, and, and uh, what you can actually trace using molecular dynamics, you can trace the movement of the molecule in time, you can trace how water molecules behave, you can trace ions, you can get a lot of important information. The problem is that the time usually will be very short for other reasons. It doesn't matter. And now let's go to the thermodynamic integration. It's a method that will use this molecule dynamics and will produce pKa values, as I defined before. Without going into details, our, our setting, where there was a main run, and then for each point here, there was a different run, would lead to 26,000 uh, or 27,000 of jobs. And it was put in the grid. Again, you have some statistics. Maybe the interesting thing is that uh, in this case, was about 20%, slightly less than 20% of jobs that failed, which corresponds with the previous curves of saturation, or in this way, of saturation of number of jobs versus time. And uh, it's recalculated, you see, on one CPU. So this calculation represent 23 years of uh, one single processor job. Again, close to the prediction. Uh, in this particular case, we had it in a few days, and uh, we could conclude that there is no open loop in acetylcholine esterase that is closed loop, which allows us to continue with the calculation further. That's it, that's the end of the story. Uh, at the end, I'd like to thank my group, especially, I'd like to thank sponsors, I'd like to thank collaborators, I'd like to thank my group, especially though the yellow-labeled people were very important because they contributed pre to preparation of all the material for this talk. And it's a pleasure to talk, uh, to, to, to thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kocha. It's always great to hear of the real science and real results that we all here, in our small part, try to enable and, and, and support. Uh, we have plenty of time for any questions and comments the audience might have. B before, <laughs> before you ask, the problem is that uh you know, these viruses and bacteria, they don't care about computing, they don't care about networking, they don't care, they don't care about computational power. They live their own lives uh, without making things for us more, more simple. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's why we are all here, to try to find ways to solve those complex problems. Andrew, please. Do we have any microphones? Yes, there's one coming up. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, Andrew Cormack from Janet UK, and anybody who knows me will tell me will know that I've got some viruses somewhere in my throat, so I'm not sounding usual. Um, the conformal modelling, where you're looking at different shapes that yes. the molecule might be, can you do that once for each molecule and then just end up with a bigger database to test against all viruses? Or do you have to do the different energy states in the presence of a virus somehow? So you have to redo those calculations every time you look at a new virus? Or is it just enlarging the set of ligands you're trying that you've got a ligand in this shape, the same one in another shape? Uh, yes, basically you can do it in advance. You can do it for a set of molecules. The problem is that, uh, uh, and it will help you a lot. The problem is that it's always a question of two, you know. So if two people meet, they will behave differently. If, if, if this couple will meet, will, it will generate different situation comparing to that couple meets, even if one is common. So if you have it, you still have to be careful because if it, it does meet with the other guy, it can behave slightly differently. Thank you. Another question? At least I don't see one. It's a bit bright up here. Okay, then maybe I, ha I have one. Uh, can you lighten a bit more about the the problem, I mean, you said that it's, it's a lot more difficult to do the calculations when you have to take into account the uh, flexible parts. Uh, so I was wondering how much more difficult, how much more complex it, it makes the problem. It, you, cannot, you cannot say it at once, it depends on the complexity of the molecule. For some of them it's the same, because the, there are molecules that are rigid. You, if you would go through the uh, if you would go to the to the pharmacy, you would go through the substances people are using as drugs. The majority of them are actually rigid, or not that much flexible, because of that problem. But uh, you know, for, for some it's almost the same. For the other, the complexity could be I don't know. One million, ten million, whatever million times more, more complex. It depends on, on the number of freely rotatable bond. So it actually depends on the chemical nature of the molecule. Okay, thank you. I, I have a one continuing question on that. Uh, I think it was quite obvious that there is no limit to the computational power that you could sort of use in exactly. these complex problems. Uh, but thinking about the uh, networks, I was interested to hear, I mean, how big are the data sets you are currently working on and, and have to move across the network? And, and what is your prediction on, on the data for the next 25 years, perhaps? For the problems I was talking about, the data travel is not that big. And therefore, the efficiency of uh, using a network is quite high, but you know, we have a different kind of problems and then we are facing a completely new situation these days when uh, especially, it is specially related to sequencing, especially relating to reading our genome. Because, uh, and that's, a, that's a, a thing that is sort of common, uh, was a lot of effort was put in, uh, in uh, development of, of hardware. I mean, not computer hardware, but machines. And sequencing related and things like that. And then the the, 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 it, it leads to a special situation, which was never before in my view, that we can generate amounts of data we 
we cannot, I mean, we cannot move from pla one place to the other one in a reasonable time. We cannot talk about networking. We, I mean, it, it becomes a problem to move it from here, from the machine, to a, a storage, to a data storage. That was a situation that was nev never before here, and I don't know how computer science will deal with it. It's certainly extremely difficult challenge for networking, data transfer. You are right. Okay, thank you. So that's one for the audience. Okay, any more questions or comments that you've thought of? There's one in the middle. Okay, I'm Jiri Navratil from Cessnet. I would like ask you about the international cooperation. I mean, you, you mentioned that you are using some databases. Uh, do you share these databases with other partners in, in Europe or in US, in, in Japan and so? And uh, what, what is the situation in, in this field? Uh, thank you for the question. It's, it's, it's really necessary because, uh, you know, current chemistry produces or has produced uh, several tenths of millions of compounds. There is no single database, I would, I would think they are, you can find everything. So uh, we have to share databases because we need to, not only databases of names, but we need databases of 3D structures. Some database, well, there are not so many databases, they are uh, private databases, they are commonly used databases. They are databases of, uh, say, substances produced by industry. Uh, I mean, the question is always what you are searching for, but uh, the, the answer is yes, we have to share. We have to, we have to share. Thank you. Do I see hands? One in the back. Hi, my name is Giovanni Moda. I'm from the University of Twente in Enscan in Holland. Uh, I'd like to know what's the, the difference, in the challenges that you have in your project here and the challenge that they had during the human genome project sequence in a couple of years ago in terms of computer science. Uh, can you clarify? Did you understand uh, a little? Bit. Clarify the question? Yes. The relation between the no, sequence. I just tr want to try to understand the relation between the challenges you're facing here in your research to the one that they have faced to the human genome project a couple of years ago. Yes. In terms of computer science. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So you are, ask you are asking about the relationship, uh, what I was talking about on the one hand, and uh, and. Uh, uh, genome sequencing data on the other hand. Mm. These are complete, completely different fields. No, no, no. Actually, in terms of the challenges in computer science, I mean, the, of the problem of the... Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Well, in my view, if I would touch the genome sequencing data, which is not purely my field, so I may not be completely right, but what I feel is that we are faced with the situation when the number of data, it doesn't apply only to, to transport data, it also applies to understand the data, which is probably even much more difficult problem. Uh, it's a big challenge for, you know, for, I don't know for what, for biologists, physicists, uh, computer scientists, it's a lot of unknown there. It's a lot of unknown, a lot of work there. To, to actually to get the proper information from the data. There's a big challenge. If there, is, if there are students here and they want to start to work in, in the field, that is certainly perspective for the future. This is the field. Okay, anyone else? No, if not, let's thank Professor Kocha once more. Thank you.
We are nearing the end of the opening plenary session. If you still bear with me a few minutes, I have just some practical matters to share with you. There is a thorough social media coverage of the conference with community blockers, tweets, pictures and videos. So you should check the conference web pages for how to join us. Uh, then, of course, no conference is complete without the parties. So tonight, the opening reception will be hel held at 8 o'clock at St. Agnes Convent downtown. There will be buses that shall take you at half past seven from the lower entrance of the Clarion Hotel next to the fountain. Remember to bring your batches so you can enter the venue. And there are a lot more things happening around the conference venue than these sessions. There are several demonstrations given every day during the breaks in Tenet and Tycho rooms. So check out the online schedule and make sure to be there. You are also encouraged to check out the poster presentations. And also the presenters will be av available in person for a chat during the afternoon coffee breaks on Tuesday and Wednesday. If you have any questions concerning logistics, please contact the regist registration desk. There are people to help you out. And also remember to give us online feedback on the conference web pages. We would very much like to hear from you. And for any other updates, Please keep on checking regularly the scrolling announcements on the conference web for any updates on these practicalities. So the conference is open. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>